Good morning, everyone. It's nice to see such great turnout for the uh, Know and Go Friday. Uh, so welcome. I, I, uh, I'm clearly not uh, Holly Brenner, uh, but don't worry. Holly will be back uh, next month for the Know and Go. Uh, she's taking a little vacation this month, and she's asked me to fill in for her. Uh, good news, she's given me a script. <laughs> give me plenty of help. Uh, if I go off track, Katie will be in here somehow. Uh, we'll start this morning like we always do our known goes with a reflection. And Michelle Reese from the Foundation is here to start off, us off with that. Thank you, Mike. Good morning. I am I'm Michelle Reese, Foundation Director, here to provide the reflection this morning, but also to remind you if you've not gotten your Samaritan cash raffle tickets, they're at the table here as you exit. And let me know if you have any questions. Thank you. This reflection is entitled, Always Be. Always be understanding to your enemies. Be loyal to your friends. Be strong enough to face the world each day. Be weak enough to know you cannot do everything alone. Always be generous to those who need your help. Be frugal with that you need yourself. Be wise enough to know that you do not know everything. Be smart enough to continue learning. Always be willing to share your joys. Be willing to share the sorrows of others. Be a leader when you see a path others have missed. Be a follower when you are shrouded by the mists of uncertainty. Always be the first to congratulate an opponent who succeeds. Be last to criticize a colleague who fails. Be sure where your next step will fall so that you will not tumble. Be sure of your final destination by setting your goals along the way. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. A couple of quick housekeeping items uh, before we get going here. Um, we, next month's uh, Know and Go program will be on addiction medicine. That's Friday, May 13th. Um, right here and again at uh, noon for the abbreviated version, Dr. Mary Kirkwood, uh, a psychiatrist, will be here to speak with us about addiction uh, medicine. Uh, there's also, I know Go is offering a Keeping Your Financial Health in Check is Important session. It's a series of online um, video lessons and interactive tools uh, to help you with uh, managing your financial health. Uh, will feature Dave Ramsey. Uh, the enrollment begins on April 4th. The cost is $40 if you're an associate of uh, Indonesian Healthcare. To enroll, www.noandgo.org and click the smart dollar uh, image. Uh, and Michelle has mentioned our raffle already, but please, uh, Samaritan Healthcare, a very worthy cause. Uh, many People in our community do not have uh, the insurance, even with the uh, ACA, and need help. The Samaritan Health Clinic assures that everybody uh, that needs it has access to health care, regardless of their ability to pay. And a, you can possibly win $100,000 uh, <coughs> by joining in on this raffle, $50 ticket for, for $150. So if you have the means, uh, to support the Samaritan Health Clinic, please do sign up for that. Uh, you have yellow comment cards on your table. Uh, keep them coming, put your feedback, and let us know how we're doing and what we can do better. Uh, Holly and the, the team that puts these together appreciates that very much. There's also green slips in front of you. Those green slips can be used if you would like to get credit uh, for being here this morning. Uh, and if you're interested in winning a wonderful prize at the end, we will be having a drawing, fill that out, and we'll pick those up and uh, do a drawing after the presentation. With that, um, it's my pleasure to introduce to you uh, Dr. Sue Kylis. Uh, Dr. Kylis is a board-certified gastroenterologist. Um, she has been with Ignatian Healthcare now for 22 years, uh, so an experienced gastroenterologist. Uh, she attended Andhra Medical College in India, obtained gastroenterology residency from Sinai Samaritan Medical Center in Milwaukee. Uh, she's fellowship trained in gastroenterology from the University of Wisconsin Hospitals and Clinics, and today she is here to help us understand a common digestive uh, health issue. So with that, I give you Dr. Kylas. Good 
Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Can you guys hear me okay? <coughs> you guys have a big voice. I don't even need a microphone. But <laughs> <laughs> well, I was asked, I think I'm going to get away from here, otherwise you can't see me. I was asked to talk about uh, some common GI issues, and they told me I had like 40 minutes. I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> There's no way I can talk about it in 40 minutes, but uh, what I want to try and do is uh, just pick up four, I picked four common problems, and I thought I would spend a few minutes about uh, talking about each of them. And there is a overlay of uh, some of these uh, diseases when it comes to the symptoms, so, so I'm kind of trying, I'm trying to put it together to see what uh, someone with a symptom comes, what is all that we think about or what uh, you all should think about when you have a symptom, and kind of see what are the things to worry and what are the things not to worry about. I know the topic said uh, the symptoms, the, the diagnosis and the treatment, uh, rather than go through each of that, uh, I will touch on that, but uh, I thought I would more talk about what are the things that you should uh, worry about, what are the things that you should uh, call your doctor, or what are the things that you shouldn't call your doctor. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to start with my first uh, slide. Yes. <laughs> 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 because that is obviously the f uh, most common uh, symptom that people come to us, either uh, to see us uh, in our clinics or to talk to us when we are at a function, at a party, or at whatever. Yeah. <laughs> oh, by the way, I just want to ask you a quick question. <laughs> Never a quick question. <laughs> but this is actually very, very common uh, complaint. Now, but gas means different things for different people. So that is something that uh, we as physicians and my nurses, we try to figure out what exactly, when someone says gas, what exactly do they mean? Um, gas may mean for someone uh, bloated, um, you know, they feel like well, bloated, they just, uh, that doesn't feel good. And some people, when they say gas, it means that they're passing a lot of gas, uh, like platers, flatulence, uh, and usually the complaint comes from the partner rather than from the patient. Um, uh, sometimes it can be belching, uh, you know. They say, I have so much gas. And I'm, then I'm like, tell me what, uh, what exactly do you mean? Oh, I'm just like, you know, always belching and belching. It's like I feel like I'm so full of gas, I've got to get rid of the gas. So there, the gas, uh, you, the person is probably talking about a reflux or some other problem, not just actually increased gas in the system. So um, constipation, of course, uh, causes people to feel bloated and gassy. But again, that doesn't mean that they have a lot of gas. It just means that they feel that. So just to kind of put it in perspective, gas is a um, very common symptom that we see. And it means different things to different people. And also, it means different things to us also once we start evaluating patients. Um, sources of intestinal gas. Before I go to that, um, the gas itself, uh, when we talk about gas, I mean, we're talking about normal gases that are out there, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, those are really the kind of gases that we have in our uh, system too. Normal amount of gas within the uh, digestive tract is about 200 cc's, which is I mean, like a small glass. So, I mean, that's really not a lot of a gas to give the kind of problems that we get. However, um, um, however, uh, uh, before we have the increased gas where you can have uh, real problems, some people can experience gas with normal amount of gas, and that is more because of uh, increased sensation within the gut that uh, makes them very susceptible to even normal amounts of gas. And I'll come to that uh, in a little bit when I cover irritable bowel part of the talk. So just so you know, the gas doesn't have to be in excess to have the symptoms of gas. Um, you can have increased air swallowing. I'll come to that again in a bit. I have one slide that talks more about it. 
But this one I just wanted to spend a little bit time uh, to talk about uh, uh, lactose intolerance and the fructose intolerance in here. Because these are uh, relatively common problems that we see. Now, when you talk about lactose intolerance, there are uh, uh, three different uh, entities here. You know, there is a lactose deficiency, which is extremely uncommon. And you see that in, um, uh, in uh, infants or younger children, uh, as they get that they're growing, they usually have some problems with uh, milk products. But that's very uncommon, and so we don't even think about it. Uh, lactose um, deficiency, uh, which we see in adults, is more a secondary problem, meaning that uh, if, you are, um, if you get gastroenteritis, or if you have uh, uh, any kind of um, inflammation that sets off in the gut, any kind of infection you develop, then what happens is the lactase enzyme, which is what you need to digest the milk and dairy product, lactose sugar, gets temporarily decreased. And that is the reason you start having the symptoms of lactose intolerance. Now, what are the symptoms of lactose intolerance? Um, and I'll talk about the symptoms uh, for the next two, three diseases. They're very similar, and that's the reason I kind of want to uh, at least have you understand that the symptoms don't really tell us much. Uh, one way or the other, we need to do a little bit more of history taking as well as exam and testing to know what the symptoms mean. Because the lactose intolerance, uh, the fructose intolerance, Celiac disease, which I'll come on later on, they all have same symptoms. Uh, you can have uh, bloating, gas, you can have diarrhea, some people can have constipation, some people can be nauseated, some people can get uh, just pain. So the symptoms can be very um, indistinguishable between uh, different entities. But what, what do we do for a lactose intolerance? If you suspect somebody has primary lactose intolerance, so I'm not talking about the one where you get an infection and you develop a temporary intolerance that usually gets better in two to three weeks at the most a month. Ask me any questions as I go along uh, because I'm keeping it very casual. Um, but uh, the primary lactose intolerance, which can be seen uh, in uh, certain uh, ethnic backgrounds, uh, you'll be surprised to see Caucasian actually do not have as much of lactose intolerance when compared to the other parts of the world. African Americans have a higher chance, Asian Americans have a higher incidence, uh, Hispanics a little bit higher. However, we do see a lot of lactose intolerance problems uh, in our population too. And the reason for that is either they have the secondary uh, intolerance, something happened and the lactase enzyme gets down, or uh, we are consuming a lot more uh, dairy products than we should. Normally, two servings of um, lactose a day, meaning two cups of, uh, two cups of milk, uh, um, Anything equal to that is usually well, uh, well uh, dealt with. But uh, if you have more than that at, in, a, in a day, then your lactase enzyme, which is what you need to digest the lactose, can uh, sometimes uh, be overwhelmed. Uh, we do, um, the most easy way to diagnose whether you have lactose intolerance or not even before you come to see the doctor, I mean, if you suspect it, I would suggest stay off of all the lactose uh, products, all dairy products, including milk, cheese, ice cream, uh, um, certain uh, lactose uh, products that they're in the um, in gravies when they make gravies. Uh, there are a lot of, uh, of uh, dairy products that can be used in uh, preparation. So just uh, pay attention to that, stay off of it completely two weeks. 
it's not three, four days, it's not, um, I, I guess one week is okay, but I, w I always say two weeks. Stay off of daily completely for two weeks and see what happens to your symptoms. That's actually a very non-invasive, no cost uh, uh, test that can uh, tell you what is happening. But one caveat, do not do this test um, if you took an antibiotic in the recent past. That can just screws up uh, the um, results. So if you have not taken any antibiotics, say for two weeks, and you want to know whether you're lactose intolerant or not, go off of uh, all dairy products for two weeks and see how you feel. If you feel good, that so there is a chance that it could be lactose intolerance. And if you want to know even 100% sure, after two weeks of no lactose, give yourself a challenge, a lactose challenge. Take a um, drink, uh, milk, um, uh, any kind of dairy product and see if you get your symptoms back. Then you know for sure you're lactose intolerant. So that's an easy way to do that. But if you're not sure, we do have some uh, ways we can test it. We have a breath <coughs> test where we give, uh, again, we give a certain dose of lactose and see, analyze how much of that is not uh, digested. And that's a really good test too. How do you treat uh, lactose um, intolerance? Uh, avoiding uh, the foods with uh, uh, lactose is uh, number one. Now again, uh, if you take lactose uh, with um, glucose, um, say like ice cream that has a lot of sugars in it and a lot of lactose, uh, sometimes you can uh, eat more of that uh, because uh, then the uh, glucose helps to move the lactose through just as a side point. If uh, you're having an occasional problems with lactose intolerance, you can try taking it with glucose and see if those symptoms uh, are not as bad. Um, but to treat it, of course, you have uh, the uh, lactate tablets, uh, lactase uh, tablets, and uh, there are a few things uh, on the market, and just follow the directions, and that's pretty good. So, so in general, lactose is uh, something that is easy to recognize, easy to treat, but the only problem is it never uh, exists uh, by itself. There's always something on top of the lactose intolerance. And the fructose intolerance is very similar to the lactose intolerance. It is more related to the fructose, which is mostly in uh, certain kinds of fruits and uh, corn, uh, things like that. Again, we don't have a test for uh, testing for fructose intolerance. A lot of that is avoidance uh, is really what uh, we suggest. <coughs> And a lot of that uh, information you can uh, gather by just looking through your <coughs> food diary and see if there is a correlation. Um, then just to kind of continue a couple more uh, slides on the gas. Uh, sometimes uh, you may be producing more gas not because you are not digesting uh, things that uh, you are eating in the diet like the lactose and the fructose. It may be because your bowel is not moving the way it should. When you eat, there is a peristalsis where the stomach is, uh, is like a grinder. It grinds the food, it makes it into a mesh and gives it into the small bowel that then digests the food and it uh, propels the food down to the colon. And it's actually a very orchestrated, um, interesting, uh, way how the whole GI tract works, which is why I was interested in going into GI. <laughs> uh, but it, that's not what I deal with mostly now. <laughs> um, so the motility is really important. The way the small bowel moves to push things through the small bowel into the colon is extremely important in keeping uh, the gas content um, in check. But there are a lot of uh, conditions where um, the motility in the small bowel is, uh, uh, is uh, um, restricted. Um, diabetes is one common one. When um, you have diabetes, especially if you have had it for many years and you have some uh, neuropathy associated with it, uh, that uh, neuropathy can also affect the nerves within the digestive tract. 
and prevent the way uh, the food and uh, digested material goes through the small bowel. So what happens if things are not moving, where do we get gas? And the reason for that is uh, the amount of uh, digested food that remains in the small bowel is exposed to the bacteria that we have in the small bowel. And the bacteria then ferment the food, and gas <coughs> is a product of the fermentation. And that's where you get the increased gas. Uh, and um, you can have, again, the same symptoms, uh, bloating, gas, uh, pain, if the gas gets trapped in certain part of the bowel. Uh, some people can have diarrhea. Uh, and the diarrhea could be pretty difficult. It may not be just the runny diarrhea, it can be malabsorbed, meaning like frothy, foul smelling, uh, where you can see some oil droplets on the toilet bowl after you have a bowel movement. Things that um, tell us that what you are eating is not di digested properly. So something like that uh, we needs to be treated uh, properly. Uh, needs to be investigated and treated. Uh, medication side effects, of course, uh, there are a lot of medicines that decrease the motility in the GI tract. Uh, we are talking about uh, um, your narcotics, you are talking about calcium channel blockers, uh, some beta blockers can do that. Um, <clears throat> one of the medicines that we use a lot, uh, the proton pump inhibitors, like uh, the prilosic, the Nexium, they can also have some effect on how the gut moves and uh, the amount of uh, bacteria within the gut, which can change the flora and give you more gas. So, so there are a variety of uh, reasons. Any questions? Sir? Uh, this one I just wanted to talk just for a minute about it because this is actually a little bit more common than uh, we think. Uh, uh, it's called aerophagia. Uh, what it is, it is uh, swallowing, uh, swallowing air when we are eating. We do not realize it, but actually when we are eating, we are swallowing air. Uh, I mean, that is a normal uh, phenomena. But sometimes if you're anxious, um, and things like chewing gum, smoking, things, uh, certain uh, lifestyle uh, that we have causes us to swallow more air. And that can cause uh, bloating and discomfort. So how to avoid it? Um, eat slow. And, uh, take your time in eating. And especially when you're talking and eating and drinking, it's like everything is going in. Uh, including the air, and suddenly you're like, oh, I just don't feel good. Uh, so just take your time uh, eating, pay more attention to how you're eating and, uh, the, uh, and uh, the avoiding the gum and smoking, the, uh, those things that can help. Um, sometimes we see this uh, as a pathological problem when uh, uh, when patients, uh, especially we see that in younger uh, women, younger folks uh, the, that are very anxious, um, have um, a lot of stress, uh, unconsciously they are uh, swallowing large amounts of air. And in them, what happens is the air actually doesn't go into the abdomen. It goes into the um, esophagus and then they belch it out. So we see patients that say, Oh, I'm just belching and belching and belching, and you just uh, don't have them talk and just sit and watch them. And you can actually see they're consciously trying to swallow air and belching it out. So that is actually a pathological problem, and that is uh, dealt with uh, uh, with the custom counseling and uh, just educating uh, uh, educating them uh, on the problem. So. So this is actually, <coughs> it's a simple enough problem to recognize, but uh, sometimes not that easy to treat because there are a lot of psychological issues involved sometimes. Okay, so um, 
I just wanted to talk a little bit about the FODMAP diet. Have anyone heard about the FODMAP diet? Uh, a few people. Um, um, it is uh, the diet that we use uh, quite a bit in uh, dealing with uh, um, when patients have the gas uh, as their complaint, uh, as their main complaint. Basically, FODMAP st stands for uh, fermentable and you can read it down here, oligodi, monosaccharides, and polyols. Basically, these are all uh, uh, simple carbohydrates. Again, if you have the motility disorder, if you have bacterial overgrowth, if you have uh, uh, any condition that causes um, things to stagnate in the bowel, diet that has these uh, products tend to make more gas. The bacteria within the gut will uh, ferment it and make more gas. So we, one of the things we do is try to avoid this uh, kind of um, diet and see if it makes a difference. Uh, when you talk about uh, fructans, you're talking about uh, the sugars uh, in, uh, in the wheat, the lactose, the milk, fructose, which is mostly in the honey, the fruits, and then the polyols uh, is this uh, cauliflower mushroom, and also your alcohol comes in there. Again, every time I talk to a patient, uh, I try to mention moderation. You know, we all have um, our own uh, things. Uh, sometimes uh, patients go to one extreme. We don't want you to avoid a whole group of uh, diet because you do need the nutrients in the diet. So we still want everyone to have a balanced diet, so in moderation. So when I say follow the FODMAP diet, I don't mean stop eating all wheat and barley products. What I'm saying is uh, uh, in moderation. Unless if you eat that and then you start having problems, then we are talking about celiac disease and we'll talk about it later. But, but again, the, this one, uh, this one uh, does help sometimes. So the only problem with the FODMAP diet, again, is uh, trying to follow it long term. It becomes uh, a pain. Now, I talked about all the different things that can cause gas and flatulence and things um, that uh, some of things we can manage at home, some of the changes we can make. Uh, but there are certain symptoms that are associated with this for which you have to come and see a doctor. So there are the certain things, we call them the alarm symptoms, uh, meaning those are the ones that uh, need to be looked into more. If you have pain at night, that's always not a good sign, especially if uh, the pain wakes you up at night. That is definitely something that uh, needs to be looked into. That's a big no-no when it comes to uh, the gas and flatulence problems. Weight loss, of course, and, and I'm talking about unintentional weight loss. Intentional weight loss is really, really good, and I encourage everyone to have that, but unintentional weight loss is what uh, I'm talking about here. Uh, blood in the stool, um, or there is a change in the way your normal pattern has been of your bowel movements without you doing anything about it. Meaning if you're usually someone that uh, has um, every third day and now you're having it every day or every day and suddenly it becomes uh, constipation. Um, yeah, anytime the, there is a change in your normal pattern, that is something that needs to be looked into. Um, again, if you have other signs like the fever, the vomiting, uh, anything, I mean, you, you know, you know what is different for you. Anything that is um, unusual, then that needs to be looked into. Okay. Um, I'll spend the last, uh, next few minutes um, on irritable bowel. Um, now, when some people talk about gas, they may, they may say it's irritable bowel, but actually they're two different conditions. What is irritable bowel? 
It could be anything actually because uh, it has many forms. Vegetable bowel has many forms. Most of the time, um, when we think about vegetable bowel, we think about uh, um, pain and diarrhea. Pain, cramping, and diarrhea is really considered is a hallmark of what we think about as irritable bowel. And urgency is another big one. Uh, you see ads um, on TV now about how everyone now wants to, is running around looking for a bathroom and how their magic medicines can make it stop. Uh, um, pain after eating, uh, urgency. Some people have constipation, some people have diarrhea, some people have gas. Uh, so irritable bowel is, uh, again, a big syndrome that has multiple uh, subgroups. So you know, because it is uh, such a common problem, uh, we think about 10 to 15 percent of uh, us uh, have irritable bowel. And of course, that is one of the most common uh, reason why we get to see patients, uh, family physicians refer patients to us all the time for managing the irritable bowel. Uh, because it is uh, such a huge problem and because uh, it is uh, a combination of so many different symptoms, uh, we have come uh, to try and uh, distribute, classify it better. In the 19, uh, I think in the 70s is when <coughs> Manning uh, described uh, some uh, hallmark criteria and then those have been uh, changed to Rome criteria in 1995, and then the Rome became Rome 1, Rome 2, Rome 3. I guess Rome is not a bad place to uh, <laughs> go and just consider it about bowel, I guess. But, uh, that, so now we follow the Rome criteria. Basically what um, they talk about is um, you should have these symptoms so two to three times uh, in a week and have those at least for two to three months uh, to be called irritable bowel. And uh, the biggest thing they talked about is uh, that your uh, pain and bowel movements are somehow related, meaning you suppose you have a pain in the stomach and um, you have the urgency and you are able to find a bathroom and go to the bathroom, have a bowel movement, and the pain goes away. That is very typical of irritable bowel. Um, now, the irritable bowel can be constipation predominant irritable bowel, or the diarrhea predominant irritable bowel, or a mixed group. The most common is the mixed group, where you alternate between constipation and diarrhea. And we hear this all the time. I just don't have a pattern. I don't know what my, what, uh, my bowels are going to do today. I can't um, live my life this way because I don't know what's going to happen. I'm at home, especially in the earlier time of the day because most of these changes happen in the daytime. So they're basically homebound until noon or one or two, and then they can do things. So, so people uh, need to get help on managing and regulating their bowel movements. Uh, because it can affect uh, what you do, how you live your life. So once uh, we figure out that it is irritable bowel, and I didn't go into a lot of uh, diagnosis for the irritable bowel only because it is really wide. And when you come in to see us, we kind of look at what kind of irritable bowel it could be or what else it could be. And we go through a diagnostic approach. It is not one diagnostic approach that fits all. So I felt uh, I should not really talk about the diagnosis uh, because it's, it's so different. But the treatment, there are some common uh, treatment um, approaches that work for all kinds of irritable bowel. So I thought I'd spend a little bit time on that. Uh, of course, time, <coughs> I'm watching the time, so it's like uh, we all have to watch the time, we all have to be sensitive about uh, um, our time, and sometimes that can put a lot of stress uh, on us. 
and how does the time affect uh, our bowel movements? We don't take the time to have the bowel movement. And uh, sometimes uh, we are in a hurry and then you are running out of the house, you are grabbing um, a big glass of whatever uh, and putting uh, so much um, into your system and you're driving and you're running and suddenly the colon is like, okay, you need to take care of me. And it tells you. And um, so the simple things that you don't have to come to the doctor for is managing the stress. Is it this, this? Uh, um, I had a picture of a crying baby, I took it out. <laughs> <laughs> um, so any kind of stress uh, and time management, I think, uh, is very important. And in that time management, I also wanted to mention um, the fact that we have to be good about uh, eating on a regular basis. Majority of us are so busy at work and we are running, so you don't eat uh, um, properly in the morning. You're worried that if you eat, you're going to have this bowel movement, so you don't eat, or you drink a little bit of something, and you're working all day long, you go home, and then you have your big meal. Wrong thing to do. <laughs> You have to eat small amounts more often to keep uh, the irritable bowel, which is really the spasms uh, within the gut, under control. So they are not uh, sitting quiet for so long and then all of a sudden they're bombarded with all these stimuli. Um, then I kind of put uh, these two things uh, just to kind of talk a little bit about uh, the kind of diet, does it matter what kind of diet you eat for irritable bowel? I showed you the information about the FODMAP diet. Uh, that has a, some, um, uh, that has a, some um, um, improvement if you follow that for the IBS type symptoms, but majority of the time we have recognized that uh, there is no one or two items in the diet that's going to set it off. It's a combination of things and how your day has been, how you're getting these food groups uh, in, it, it's a combination. In the past, about 15, 20 years ago, we used to have uh, patients maintain a food diary and then we'd go through that and eliminate certain things and see if it makes a difference. We don't do that anymore. I mean, I do have patients that bring a food diary. If there is something obvious then of course you eliminate that, but you will notice most often you will not find anything obvious. Um, but uh, not skipping a meal, eating at a regular time, taking uh, your time um, uh, for the good bowel habits. Uh, you know, when we were kids, we were taught uh, <laughs> to take our time to uh, brush our teeth, take our time to have a, to use the bathroom. And, I mean, you know, those things, uh, we don't follow that as we get older, and if you continue to follow that, most of these symptoms can be under control. Then I did put one small <coughs> box here of medicines, and uh, I thought I'd even make it smaller because um, there are some medicines that uh, we can use very effectively to treat the irritable bowel, but it is a lifelong problem, so we tend to talk more about the lifestyle changes to manage that. However, I have a lot of patients uh, who are um, quite, uh, their life is uh, quite a bit um, um, restricted because of how severe these uh, symptoms are, and those people we can easily, easily treat with medicines. And we have a whole uh, group of medicines that we can use. Um, I know on the TV now there are uh, quite a few advertisements for uh, oh, who remembers the, the bloated stomach, the blue bloated stomach, and then uh, they talk about linzas. Uh, um, that's for constipation. Now they're talking about uh, different medicines for the diarrhea of the, uh, part of the irritable bowel. Um, then we have medicines to treat the pain. So we do have some really nice medicines. And one of the mistakes that the physicians uh, do uh, sometimes is 
Um, you go in there to talk to a physician and they know that it is irritable bowel, they just say it's irritable bowel and don't give you any uh, ways to manage that. Uh, and so there is a feeling that irritable bowel is more a psychological problem, it's not uh, a real problem, but it is actually a real uh, organic problem that can be treated. So. Uh, yeah, if uh, you feel uh, uh, you have these uh, symptoms, uh, you know, do talk to either your physician or see a gastroenterologist because we can uh, give you some medicines to improve the symptoms. And I have so many patients that uh, after we treat, uh, their lifestyle has become uh, so good. I mean, they don't have to uh, look for bathrooms everywhere they go. I mean, they can actually. I had a patient that went on all these trips uh, um, all over the world, and before she was just homebound. She just couldn't go anywhere. She says, I can't fly going on a flight. That's impossible. I don't know when I have to use the bathroom. And simple measures and simple medicines, now she's uh, traveling. So yeah, it has a major impact um, on lifestyle. So it can, uh, not only you, do you need to diagnose the irritable bowel, but there are ways to treat it, and I think sometimes the ball gets dropped uh, on the treatment part. So just talk to your doctor about it. There are ways we can treat it. What is your thought on taking probiotics? Uh, thank you. Uh, probiotics is, uh, in, uh, is something that is uh, useful in a certain sector. Not everyone with irritable bowel will benefit with probiotics. And there are many different kinds of probiotics on the market, so you need to be careful about uh, which kind. Um, but I think probiotics are good if they are taken uh, in the appropriate setting at the appropriate dose. Okay. Then I'll move on to, then I'll spend another five minutes talking about uh, reflux and then maybe another five minutes uh, talking about uh, celiac disease. And then if there are any questions, we can answer that. Um, acid reflux, again, is another common problem. About 10 to 15 percent of us do have acid reflux, but not all of uh, uh, people with acid reflux come to see the doctor. Uh, in the irritable bowel, uh, when I, I talked about 10 to 15 percent, uh, women uh, don't necessarily have a more uh, reflux, but they tend to come and uh, get care more often for them, <coughs> which is good because then you can uh, manage it properly. Whereas for the reflux, uh, again, it is common uh, as far as men and women. Um, again, we do see more uh, women uh, coming <coughs> to the to the doctor to manage the reflux. But we also see a lot of men that can't manage their reflux because their wife made them come. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it is actually a, a common problem. What happens um, well, in, a ref in reflux, what are your symptoms? The main symptom is heartburn. You feel a burning sensation in the chest. That is the most common symptom. But we also have a um, lot of other symptoms, uh, such as chest pain, um, just a tightness, a cough, or a feeling of uh, something is in the throat that you need to clear all the time. We call the global sensation. That is part of the reflux symptoms. Um, gas and bloating, I mean, sometimes um, the reflux can show up just as gas, bloating, or nausea. So there are a variety of symptoms how the reflux can present. But what happens? Why do people develop reflux? So, uh, here is the stomach and the esophagus. Right at the junction of the stomach and the esophagus, right here, is uh, a valve. It's a one-way valve. It's called lower esophageal sphincter, or LES. And the job of the valve is to allow, when we eat, to open up and allow the food to go down from the mouth into the, through the esophagus into the stomach. 
but then when um, the stomach is empty or even full of food, it's supposed to close off to prevent the acid and the other juices backing up. So it's a one-way valve. What happens is this valve does not work properly. Either it does not close tight after you swallow, or it remains loose um, even in a fasting state when there is no food in the stomach. And when it is loose, um, things that are in the stomach can back up. What do you have in the stomach when you are not eating? You have acid, you have a lot of enzymes, uh, pepsin and uh, other uh, mucus and other things that the acid the stomach makes. As long as they stay in the stomach, it's okay. But once uh, it uh, reflects back into the esophagus, the lining in the esophagus cannot deal with the acid. It's a very strong acid, and so it burns, and that's where you get the uh, that's where you get uh, the heartburn. And why does this uh, valve not to work properly? Uh, we don't know. We think that it is, could be an infection that uh, uh, people were exposed in early childhood that uh, causes this uh, valve to dysfunction as we get older. But uh, it can run in the family. Some people just have a tendency to have the reflux. Uh, and uh, sometimes uh, gaining weight, especially if you gain abdominal uh, fat that puts pressure on the stomach and that increases uh, the uh, ability to reflux. Uh, so there are a variety of reasons uh, that can cause that. Then I wanted to talk a little bit about the high hernia because that is a relatively common uh, condition. Mm, again, uh, showing that this is the valve that prevents uh, acid from backing up. If it is not working properly, it can back up and cause damage to the esophagus. Now this uh, part, this shows uh, the hiatal hernia. What it is, is a, this here is the diaphragm and you can see the stomach is under the diaphragm in the abdomen. Uh, in some people, the opening in the diaphragm through which the esophagus comes up is loose. And when that happens, portion of the stomach comes up into the chest. Depending on the size of that um, sac that comes up into the chest, you can have a variety of symptoms. Most of the time, I would say 90% of the time, these uh, hiatal hernias are small and do not need any surgery. We treat them like we treat acid reflux, uh, and that should take care of it. But occasionally, they can be huge, and uh, I have had patients uh, whose uh, entire stomach is in the chest, and they can have um, um, problems not only just eating and maintaining uh, their weight, but they can actually have life-threatening problems where this um, sac can get strangulated in the chest, and that can be a life-threatening emergency. So if you have a hiatal hernia, I think you do need to have it addressed, um, at least to see the size of the hernia. If it is uh, small, no worries. Small to medium, no worries. If it is large, then you need to think about uh, your options, surgical options. Now, why should we even treat the reflux? I mean, I know there are uh, thousands and thousands of people walking around on the street uh, having a heartburn a couple times uh, a week. They take tons, they feel fine. They're like, you know, I don't want to waste my time, money, and uh, getting this treated, I'm fine. They're not. Um, there are three main things that uh, we worry about, and this is the common one. It is an ulcer. As the acid irritates the lining, it develops ulcers. And uh, if we do not uh, treat the ulcers properly, then it can go on to two different things. Uh, one is it can form scar tissue, which then causes uh, narrowing of the esophagus, and you can develop trouble swallowing. And we have come um, many, many, many nights uh, for patients who have had trouble swallowing, uh, have meat uh, stuck in their uh, esophagus because they just can't swallow. They can't swallow saliva. I mean, they're very miserable when that happens. 
and that's because of uh, the scar tissue here that prevents uh, them swallowing solid food. Uh, so we want to prevent that, we want to prevent this, and we want to prevent uh, this. What it is, is it's, um, it's a different kind of lining in the esophagus. Uh, about 100 people that uh, have the reflux, about uh, five of them will develop this kind of lining where um, the esophagus, as it is trying to heal itself from the acid damage, it uh, heals in a different way. The lining becomes uh, much more um, much more uh, sensitive to turning to cancer. So if someone develops this kind of lining, we do consider that as a precancerous lesion and it needs to be managed properly. Having said that, um, it is not, I mean, once you have bad, it does not mean that you're going to have cancer. Majority, I would say 95 to 98% of the Barrett's can be managed uh, very well with the medicines that we have now, with other treatments that we have now, so that they don't progress on to developing cancer of the esophagus. Um, I mean, I'm happy to say that with all the stuff that we are doing with managing the reflux, uh, uh, the, um, certain cancers in the esophagus have actually gone down even though a different kind of cancer has gone up, but uh, the kind of cancers that are associated with acid reflux have gone down in the last uh, 20 years. So we are doing something uh, good. Okay, I just put out a, it's kind of a busy slide, but um, I would say if you have acid reflux, the things that you can do to help it uh, is, um, uh, let's like uh, it differs from person to person. But the take home in this uh, slide, I would say is caffeine and uh, chocolate. <laughs> um, because uh, chocolate uh, does have some caffeine and some acidic foods in it, acidic content in it. So those um, are one of the things that I always um, I always suggest to my patients, caffeine, chocolate. Now, alcohol, I always get a question about alcohol and the reflux. Um, alcohol uh, in moderation, again, when I talk moderation, I'm sure it's different for different people, but in general, we are talking about one drink of any kind, like maybe a glass of wine, um, one beer, uh, hard liquor, maybe just one dose. Uh, uh, once a week uh, on the average is okay, but the key to that is after you have the alcohol, you should not have the alcohol on an empty stomach. You should eat uh, with the alcohol. Then the chances of um, the, all, uh, the reflux get... Uh, Your attention please, hold show, track one, emergency department, room three. Your uh, attention please, uh, low. hold show, and then, track um, one, also, if Emergency you have food in your stomach or with the alcohol, less of the alcohol gets absorbed, liver damage is also low with that. So. Track one, um, room three. Um, any questions on the reflux? Again, there are these alarm symptoms in the reflux too. If you have uh, more reflux at night time, if you have trouble swallowing, you have weight loss that you're not working on, those are all the things if you have, uh, you should always come and see your doctor. And then the other guideline I usually use is if you have, if anyone has a heartburn twice in a week on a consistent basis, like two to three times uh, uh, a week for two to three weeks at a time, then it is something that needs to be looked at. It's not um, something that you just take uh, like OTC, Pepsi, and uh, uh, be done with it. So. Okay, this one, uh, I kind of put this up to talk uh, about the celiac disease. Uh, I know there is uh, more interest about the celiac now. What is celiac disease is, uh, it's a busy slide, I couldn't find the, I had a nicer one, but I just didn't find it. But basically, oops, what celiac disease is, it is a condition where uh, the small bowel lining, it's uh, being nice and uh, uh, 
a nice uh, this way, it becomes flat. What, uh, what do you care? I mean, it stays up or down, flat, what do you care? Uh, you care because uh, when it flattens, it's not doing its job uh, of digesting and absorbing the food that you eat. So why does the, the lining of the small bowel flatten? It flattens because of a reaction to a certain uh, product in the diet called gluten. Gluten is a protein that you see in the wheat and the rye products. Uh, certain people have uh, an immune reaction to gluten in the diet. Where the gluten um, causes irritation to the lining and you can have all these different kinds of damages to the lining of the esophagus and finally the esophagus just flattens out, does not do its job. So that's called celiac disease. What kind of symptoms do you have with celiac disease? It's the same thing. I mean, <laughs> uh, you can have bloating, you can have uh, constipation, you can have diarrhea, you can have weight loss, you will have anemia sometimes if it is not uh, recognized. Uh, uh, you can develop uh, deficiencies, vitamin D deficiency, you can develop uh, folic acid deficiencies, and you can uh, have uh, problems with the nutritional problems because you're not digesting and absorbing the food properly. Um, it is, uh, how do you get it? How uh, you don't get it, it is uh, something uh, that is, um, in some patients it is genetic. Um, I would say about two thirds of patients it is genetic, so someone in your family may have had it. And in the other one third, again, we think it's an infection that your body was exposed to and somehow it uh, uh, stimulates a certain part of the immune system which then starts damaging the lining of the small bowel. The treatment is, um, um, so that is the immune reaction. The, uh, the diagnosis is um, easy in a way because there are a variety of blood tests that can be done <coughs> to see if you have this allergic reaction to gluten in the diet. And you can also do um, uh, biopsies uh, from the small bowel, which gives you the definitive diagnosis of uh, uh, celiac disease, uh, the way the biopsies uh, look. However, um, there are some really neat blood tests uh, in the recent uh, four or five years that are as good or if not better than uh, the biopsies. So sometimes we just use the blood test to make a diagnosis but we still need the biopsy to give us uh, an information of the extent of the disease. <clears throat> How do you treat it? That's the easy part. Uh, is, uh, to, uh, easy in the sense, uh, it's simple. We know what to do, but it's not easy to do it. Um, <clears throat> avoid all gluten in the diet. And the best way is uh, talk to the dietitian and uh, um, follow the instructions. It's simple to do. I think we are running low on time. So I'll quickly talk about this other problem, the gluten sensitive. That is the more difficult and more prevalent uh, uh, problem. Uh, celiac disease we can uh, diagnose. The gluten sensitive uh, uh, persons we cannot because we have no way, no blood test, no biopsies, no nothing. But the key, the key for this is uh, that we know that the gluten ingestion causes difficulties, you stop gluten, you feel better. Can't argue with that. <laughs> if you feel, you do something, you feel better, you should do that. The only problem is make sure when you do that, you still get all your nutrients, your calcium, your vitamin D, and things like that. Other than that, I think I'm going to stop here. These were all uh, just uh, things I was going to show you, but I think I'll stop here. Thank you, Dr. Kallis. One uh, last uh, chance for any questions. Anybody had? If not, uh, while you're thinking of questions, please pass your green slips and yellow slips to the right. Katie will be taking those and uh, coordinating our drawing in just one second. And you can just see one hand. So if we have questions while we're doing that, go ahead. Why do you have an age limit on the age of a child we'll see? Um, because we are trained that way, we are. Uh, I don't uh, guess, um, 
Um, before we go into GI, we have to do a other basic training, internal medicine. And so uh, the internal medicine or PEDS, uh, you have to do the internal medicine or the PEDS training. So a person that goes into the PEDS residency then goes into the PEDS gastroenterology fellowship. A person that does um, internal medicine residency goes into adult gastroenterology fellowship. So that's why we are trained different. And uh, the problems uh, that uh, children have, uh, some of them are very similar. When you talk about the reflux, when you talk about the gluten uh, sensitivity, uh, they are very similar. However, their management is different. And also, children have uh, other uh, other uh, things that can also present the same way, which we are not trying to manage. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kylis. And with that, I think, she had a question. I think we need to do our drawing. Yeah. And we may have to ask uh, the question to come to Dr. Kylis right after, because I know some of you need to get to 9 o'clock ships that you're on. So. Okay, what do I okay. Pick one. <laughs> I didn't put my name in No. <laughs> oh, Katie Tang. Um, Kathy Guy. Congratulations, Kathy. 